when we're dealing with navigating the, the sequences and the timelines, we, you know, there's, everyone has their own secret, you know, keyboard shortcuts. Um, what I'd like to do is show you mine. Hey, there's Tyler. That's Tyler Nelson's buddy of mine. He works on all of Fincher stuff. He's very smart and he edits like a maniac. Um, all right, so keyboard shortcuts. Here's something that I do, and I'll show you what it looks like. Um, the defaults are great. Every time I work with new editors, they're like, oh, I'll just learn Adobe Premiere Pro shortcut. I don't think that's the best move. If you're coming from Avid or if you're coming from Final Cut Pro, try and match what you already know with what you have in front of you. It's very, 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 very deep under Edit, Keyboard Shortcuts. You can map it to anything you want. And here's the secret of my system, because what I want to do in my timeline is I want to be able to zoom in, zoom out. I want to be able to make my video tracks taller, my audio tracks taller, or just re return everything to the smallest area, smallest you know footprint, and be able to just bounce around quickly. And I do that with keyboard shortcuts, because I do not like trying to raise one track here, you know, or scrolling. You can shift scroll and you can do that, that's fine. But I prefer keyboard shortcuts and mapping it to one area. So here's what I map my left hand on my keyboard shortcuts to. So the tilde in the top left maximizes whatever screen I'm hovering over so I can have the biggest size, which is great for laptops when there's less real estate. Uh, the number one increases the video track height in my timeline one click at a time. So it does just the video, not just the audio. Number two does my audio, makes my audio tracks bigger. And number three minimizes all tracks in the timeline to the smallest. So I can quickly get back to neutral and just not have it take up space. So I map those. those are, these are the names of the functionality under keyboard shortcuts that I use. Number four and five is go to previous marker and go to next marker. I use that when I get into my marking of, of clips. And the whole approach to pancake timelines is essential. You have to have this, and we're going to get into that next. Uh, the ripple trim previous and, and edit point in next lets you just trim a shot, and it's all on my left hand. It's all taking up the keys on the left side. A is going to get me back to neutral with my, my selector, so I'm not doing anything. Flip lets me slide a shot left and right, but keeping the in point the same, so I'm not messing up that. And then Z and X I do for zoom in and zoom out. So looking at it on my timeline, if I hit tilde, I go here. I'm going to zoom into the timeout with Z. I zoom out with X so I can see everything. Holding number one down, every click gets me a higher video track. And then I can zoom in if I want to see, you know, what my video looks like. Number three makes it all small. And number two makes all the audio bigger. So I can zoom in and see all the waveforms. And then once I'm done, I'm like, all right, that looks good. I can hit three and it goes back to little and I zoom out. That saves me from the control plus and control minus with my right hand. Everything falls underneath my left hand when I set up my keyboard shortcuts this way. And, and so that's something that I've come to really absorb and make me a faster, more efficient editor by zipping around without having to do shift and scrolls and a little keyboard scrolling stuff. So those are my keyboard shortcuts. Um, now, I think the, the best way to get into the meat of it is let me take a sip of water here. I'm parched. I don't talk this much. This is fun, but hopefully, hopefully exciting and engaging. Stand by. Oh, that's refreshing. Okay. So what I want to get into is the basically the core of the editorial um, using the pancake timeline the proper way and also how to approach projects that have a lot of footage because it can become unmanageable. If you open a bin on the left side and you just have a bin full of stuff and you open it up, your options are list view, which doesn't tell you what it is. You, you have to double click to load it in the source, then you're jumping around. Or you can do thumbnail view, and then you have a list of shots, which is fine. And you can scroll through and pick the little pieces and parts you want. But if you can't make a marker on them, you can't mark certain things here properly and see them. Um, you also have freeform view, which is what is what most editors use where you have one shot and if there's associated shots you can make them underneath and you kind of group them together and they're free floating so you can move these chunks around if these shots on the right are my bad shots i don't want them close i just want my good shots then i'll do i'll set it up like this and again to see this i have to double click on it so it goes to the source 
And then I can pick from the four cameras that this is the main multi-cam. These are the four shots that made that multi-cam. Now I'm going to do that, which is fine. You can work from a bin. A lot of people do. If you only have 10 or 20 shots, you can just load all your shots in a bin and just click them one at a time and load them up. There's nothing wrong with that. For is a system called string outs or chem rolls. And what that means is, let's say on this day we shot three hours of footage. I will take all that raw footage, put it in one timeline. So it's all laid out like this. I'll make this big. So let's assume this is one day of footage and it's, you know, it's right now an hour and 45 minutes of footage. If I zoom in, you can see bigger. I don't think I have my video thumbnails. Okay, let me turn that on. So now you see all the different shots that are in my timeline. Um, I have an hour and 45, almost three hours of, or two hours of footage. So it's all in my one, one timeline, which is good because this shows sequentially and chronologically how we shot that day. So the start of this timeline is the morning. Then we go downstream, we're shooting, we're shooting by the, we get to lunch, shooting in the afternoon, we're shooting in the evening. So this is a chronological timeline of what we shot on the day. What often happens with the editor, if he's not there or if he is there, or the director, if you're showing the footage, what will happen is you'll be like, where's that shot? And the director will be like, well, I know we shot it like late in the day. That means you can go over to the, to the right side of this timeline that has three hours, and you can highlight and show the footage here later in the day. And the director will be like, oh, that's the shot. That's the one I wanted. If you were in bin view, you'd have to individually load every clip and then look at it here and then it takes way too long and you don't know. Sometimes these aren't set up chronologically and you have to scroll through hundreds of shots. I have probably 100 shots in this timeline and I can quickly scroll through and I have a visual representation of where we were during the day. Now the next step to that is zooming in and then at the start of every new setup, Let's say these first six shots were the first scene we shot, then we went to a new setup. I will add a marker by hitting M at the first shot of a new setup. And I will call this, I'll give it a name, you know, this is setup two. And then I say, okay. And then at the first frame, I'll do another marker and then I'll just say, you know, setup one. You can use obviously shot, shot takes or shot names. But what you do is as you scroll through, you make a marker at every new setup, and you'll see why in a minute how this is crazy effective. So, and let's say we'll go down here and we'll do another one here, setup four, and I'll do setup four. What this allows me to do is now I have these markers in my timeline, and I'll do one more just because we. And this is setup five. What this allows me to do is with my keyboard shortcuts is. If I sit down with the director or if I'm looking at shots, I'm like, all right, these are the first set of shots. Assuming the last one was probably good, so I can start with that and I can grab that and move on. Now to get to the first shot in the next setup, I just hit next marker. And so next marker for me is five on my keyboard shortcut. Previous marker is four. So I can now bounce from the first shot of every new setup just by one key. And every time I click it, it goes to the first shot of a new setup. So I'm looking at brand new shots, the whole new sh shot setup by one key. And if I go back, same thing. And more importantly, if I go to the second setup here, I then use down arrow to go to the first frame of the next take. So using four shortcuts, keyboard shortcuts, I can go to the next shot setup, sorry, setup. So it's a brand new shot. And then up and down arrow gets me to the next shot, the first frame, so I can review it, preview it. And if there's a section of shots like this shot here, I know that there are 20 takes. I can go to the very end because I guess probably, hopefully the director was getting a really good take at the very end and I can use one of these shots. And then I can hit next, uh, next marker and go to the first shot of the next setup. So imagine that with five hours of footage, if there's 60 shots, yes, you have to make 60 markers, but you can now bounce between them. And since we gave them a name, I always keep my markers tab open which allows me to see all my markers that I've created and see the names of them here. And if I click on any of them, my timeline will go to wherever that marker is here. So on the left, I'm clicking on the image that shows me the first shot. 
on the right, the playhead is moving there. So I get to be able to bounce around now two ways. I can visually eyeball it, or I can go by, oh, set up one, boom. Now I'm at set up one, first shot. That to me is extremely, extremely powerful. And that's the core of my system when I'm dealing with sitting down with eight hours of daily footage all at one time. I'm, I'm able to look at it, I'm able to organize it, and I'm able to manage it. And so now 10 hours of footage isn't as daunting as looking in a bin and seeing, you know, 10 hours of footage as 300 clips, you know, in one bin where you're like, I don't even know how to operate that. I, I don't know what to do. Using this chem roll or string out, I, again, I lay out all the footage chronologically, how it was shot um, on the day, if it's a feature film or whatever, or if it's your project, then you can say, all the wide shots are first, all the medium shots, all the close-ups, however you want to split it up, keep it all in one timeline that you could zoom in and out of, add your markers so you can split up the new setups, the new selection of shots, and then use up and down arrow to go to the next frame. Now, this is um, what Fincher's team has been doing since, you know, for 15 years. What they'll do is, if these first green shots, the best shot that they're using that they like, they'll raise it one track. So it's raised up from the other ones. So they'll go to the second setup. They'll go, oh, that was the best shot. They'll raise that one track. So it just pops out a little bit more. Here's a third selection. Let's say that's the best shot. Or if there's two best shots or ones that we should be aware of, we haven't changed the complexion of the timeline. We've just raised it one layer. So that way, any shot that you like or your hero shot, or if it's something that you want to show the director, instead of making another marker, you just we just raise that one track higher so then that way it stands out and you can see over this shot i have all right i got eight shots that i really love i think they're really going to work for each shot those are my best ones and then if i want to start building a sequence um i will have this super edit one here this is going to be an empty timeline or or whatever but to make a pancake timeline if you haven't seen there's a couple of ways but if you take the name the nameplate super edit and I want to work with the raw footage, I take super edit, drag it down underneath until there's this red trapezoid or purple trapezoid and let it go. You now have two timelines stacked on top of each other. Now I can go to this raw footage. I can grab just the, the best shots that I wanted that I've already highlighted. And oh, this, and then I can just drag them down and put them in my lower timeline here and just stack them, you know, stack them on, on top of my other stuff. Um, so I have, what I'll often do is I'll have my raw footage in the top timeline here, and then I'll have my, the timeline that I'm cutting into on the bottom. So all my raw footage here, all the stuff on the bottom. Now most people will grab shots that they like, and then they will just take it and drop it down underneath, which is fine. You can do that. It's not very um, accurate in terms of, you have to make edits if you want to do pieces of parts or you have to literally make cuts and then you take that and you take it down here. So you just take that little part. Um, that's one way to do it. And if you're building something from scratch that's big and bold and still not very refined, you can do that. But most editors that are trying to get a cut together want to have a slightly finer cut right out of the gate. Something more accurate as opposed to 30 second takes where we drop a 30 second tape sorry, 30 second take into our bottom timeline, then trim that. So there is a better way, and I'm gonna show you that. This is the way that I do everything. Um, so I'll take my super edit, I'll put it back here. Um, I will go to my sequences. I will take the raw footage and I will close that because I don't want that open yet. Now I'll go to raw footage here and I can do one of two things. I can right click and I can right click and open, um, what I want to do is open it in the source monitor. So open in source monitor is here. So I take my sequence with all my raw footage, hit open the source monitor. It's now up here in my source monitor, which is great, but it's all the clips I can't see them, so that doesn't do anything for me. The secret to the pancake timeline done correctly is loading a, a sequence into the source monitor, then hitting the wrench and saying open sequence in timeline. Here's what happens. I now have raw footage source monitor, this timeline here. It has a red playback head and all the 
the clips are visible underneath and I'm looking at it in the source window. Now, when I take my super edit and put it underneath, I now have stack timelines, pancake timelines. The top timeline has all my shots, all my raw footage that I can bounce around and use the markers and it's playing in my source. The bottom timeline has a blue playback head and it's my output. So now I have complete control and visibility of all my footage in the left and my output on the right. Previously, everything was shown here and only one shot would be visible here, you'd have to load it. Now I have complete access to all my source footage and my output. And here's the kicker. Because I set up my presets, which I was telling you about earlier, the insert, if you hit mark in and out. So now instead of having to cut this clip to drop it down into this timeline, let me zoom in here, I'm gonna drop it here. Now I just hit in, out, and I hit insert. And what happens is it drops it down underneath at my playhead, just this piece of the in and out with the audio and picture. If I don't want the audio, I can turn off the audio and then only the picture will go. So now I can scroll through my shots using my left source monitor. I can say that's a nice start point and I wanna end it here. I hit insert and on the bottom timeline, it's been added. I don't have to drag it and then cut it. I can just pick it and move it. To me, that was the game changing, and I know game changing is used often, but through it, I think this is magical. And now I have access to all my footage, and I can also keep my markers tab open on the left-hand side now. So now, if the director's like, take me to shot, scene two, take one, I can click this. It comes up on the left here. I can have, I can now play this back, in the source and I can drop it into the active timeline that I'm building out of. So now I have best of both the world in terms of access to all my footage. It's labeled with markers that I can interact with here and move around the timeline. I'm always seeing the source and on the, and on the bottom timeline, I'm always seeing the output. So that's a huge difference than just stacking two timelines and dragging and not being able to see all these shots and have interaction with it and not seeing the markers. So to do the proper, Pancake timeline, once again, I'll just, and again, it's in the document, so try and absorb it all. I know I'm talking a lot. I'm already like losing my voice. It's a lot of fun sharing this, but take your raw footage, right click, open in source timeline, open in source monitor, sorry, or you can drag it directly there. Once it's loaded, hit the wrench and do open sequence and timeline. And you'll see it says source monitor next to the timeline that you loaded. And you'll see that it has a red playback head which means it'll be showing in the top left. The blue playback head on my other timeline that I'm cutting into is always on the right, the, the program out, my final edit. So that is the quick and dirty approach of how to set up a proper pancake timeline and how to properly interact with a lot of footage. So next time you have a documentary where you have 20 hours of footage, uh, most people don't know, a Premiere Pro timeline can hold 24 hours of footage in it. So I've, ha I've had timelines where I'm scrolling through 24 hours of footage, all labeled with markers that I can see over here, and then I can find the chunk I want, zoom in, do that, do that little in, out, my play marker here, play head here, and just drop it in, and it drops it in. So I have access to 24 hours of footage, but I'm, I can just pick the littlest, tiniest piece that I need and I can create a fine edit right out of the gate as opposed to dragging huge chunks and then trying to cut it underneath. So I think that's what most people don't get to see or they just think stacking timelines and dragging is the secret. It's actually loading your raw footage in source, opening it in its source monitor, and then using in and out and insert to accurately share projects. That's what every Hollywood editor does once they get a lot of footage. This is what Fincher's team has done. I mean, they win Oscars every other year for best editing. And a lot of it is because of organization and management of the, of the files and the footage. Um, I guarantee this will make you a better editor because you become more familiar with the footage. You'll be able to bounce around and manage that footage better. If the director comes in, you have a timeline of day three. Here's day three. Here's all the things I did in day three. Which shot do you want to see? The, pain in your side and your heart and in your head when a director wants to see a shot and you are 
clicking through bins and trying to load one shot at a time is the worst feeling ever. So at least try it. Try using a system where you do chem, chem roll string outs, all your footage in one timeline, make the markers, load it, and then interact. So that is pancake timeline, including the markers, all that kind of stuff. The core of my system, it allows me to tackle the biggest projects without having any issues. And it's, you know, to me, it's really, it is magical and, and super effective. Um, quick water break for me. Hold on, please. Um, before we go on to audio and uh, video effects, um, I think we're, we're plugging along well. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing some stuff that means a lot to me. Um, but there's some shareables that I want to talk about again. Like this is the edit bay for um, the good doctor. So we went in there. This is how a TV editor, that's their station. Like these are things that people need to see because a lot of people don't get to go into these rooms. So this is um, Sandra. This is her edit bay. She does a standing desk, three screens and an output monitor, and all her little sticky notes, analog style of keeping track of everything. And this is how you just sit and you crank away. And um, so it's no different than you at your desk, wherever that may be. But that's, that's the, the stuff that we have to do. That's how we tackle all this stuff. Um, this is important too. Like a lot of people ask, like when you're editing, you know, how many shots in a film, you know, it can be from 1300 for a lot of, not a lot of shots or 3,500 shots in a Transformers film. These are just a quick overview what I like to count and find out the, the rhythm and pacing. The average of the edits, the average shot length for all the different directors. I calculated all their films and and you can see that like Woody Allen, 17 and a half seconds for every shot. That's the average. Michael Bay is three seconds for every shot. That makes kind of a lot of sense. You know, Spielberg's in the middle, about 6.8 seconds a shot. You calculate that times two hours and you'll figure out how many shots are in a film. So you'll notice that Woody Allen, you know, uh, Woody Allen, he won the Oscar for best film for Annie Hall. There were only 225 shots in that entire film. Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King had 3,500 shots in it. It won Best Picture. So these are just little things I kind of look at when I'm not at my edit bay because I want to um, think about that and, like, you know, be more than a machine pushing buttons and building stuff. I want to see the reverse engineer of the process, the editorial process. And this is a little, just another quote that, I, that spoke to me that I came up with that made sense that said, filmmaking is a mechanical process. But storytelling is an emotional craft that benefits from life experiences. Anyone can drive a car. The bigger question is, where do you want to go? Most important editing decisions are made with the heart and the gut, not with a keyboard or a mouse. Um, I'm guilty of it, but I sometimes won't, you know, I'll be stuck in my edit bay. I need to go out. I need to go for a walk. I need to go for a run, go to a museum, read a book, do something that just shakes my headspace up so I can come back with a clear head. Um, things like that are super important important to me, um, and it should be to you as well. It's that the life-work balance is hard to achieve, and uh, I'm guilty of it, and I have to work better at it. So I think we should, we all we all should. Um, in terms of audio inside a project, there's a couple again tricks and tips that I use a lot that some people don't know about that they should. Um, one of the biggest is if we're, we're not, I don't think you can hear the audio because we're not allowed to have audio playing, but, but here's my friend. If you guys know Jason Levine, um, I directed him in a short film and this is him and he's talking and, and whatnot. And I want to focus on the audio. There's a director. Okay. Big time director. Um, so I want to focus in when he starts talking. All right, so he says yes there. Um, I'm zoomed in right now all the way when I'm looking at this word yes. And I'd like to, you know, try and do something with it, but I, 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 I'm limited by the frames. I'm limited by one frame, you know, 24 frames a second, so I can't really work his word. A lot of editors have to cut up dialogue, cut the S off a word try and create Frankenstein words from people's, what they're saying, especially documentary editors or people that are just, you know, off camera. We are cutting up their words, 
closing gaps, making little little holes in it so that it works better. Um, what most people don't know is we can get subframe editing, meaning we're not limited to 24 frames. In this sequence, in this timeline, if you go to the little hamburger next to what I'm working on and you go change it to show audio time units, if I change to that, um, previously I could only zoom in, that was as zoomed in as I could go. Now, if I go full screen so you could see this, now if I zoom in, I can zoom in to 48,000 samples per second. So again, you can't hear it, it sounds all staccato because I'm literally looking at 48,000 samples per second as opposed to 24 frames. Um, that means this word yes, this right here is the end of the yes. If I want to cut that off, I can zoom in to here and then hit edit. I'll make an edit there and I'll zoom out here. And now if I edit that out, I've cut the S off. And then if I cut back, if I go back under the hamburger menu next to the file, the sequence, and I say show audio time units, now I'm back to frame rate. And you can see that its frames are up here. Now I've cut with, you know, smaller than a frame, I've cut just the S off, which I couldn't get to before. Previously, you'd have to just like add a default, you know, trans, um, you'd add a transition, audio transition, then like make it one frame or two frames, and it would fade out. Now, when you're dealing with audio, you can just change it to audio time units, have access to subframe editing, and go in there and chop it up. And then you're, you're halfway there, which is super important for me. Um, another trick that I use all the time is this volume here in these two clips, this is louder than this one, obviously. The bigger the waveform, the louder. If I have an interview or I have dialogue and I want to make sure everything's balanced, there's you know settings that you can go into and balance it. But what I like to do is grab both shots, hit G for audio gain, and then um, normalize max peaks to minus six. What this does is it'll, if it's too hot, it'll lower it. If it's not loud enough, it'll raise it up. So the loudest part is minus six. Minus six is a good number to think about. Zero is distorted when you're talking about audio and we never want that. So this will balance your audio. So if you had five hours of audio, you could just highlight it, hit G, normalize max peaks to minus six, which is a good number. And then all your dialogue will be living in the same, same range of volume so you don't have to make those adjustments all the time. Um, so that's a super important audio tip that I use. With this music here that I'm about to play, again, you can't see it, but, I mean, sorry, you can't hear it, you can see it, but if I were to try and guide this through and make adjustments on audio to make it louder and quieter, I would have to use control and start making keyframes, and then I'll say, okay, I wanna make it quieter here, and I would drag this down, and then I would have to play it and wait and listen. That's all fine and good, but there's a lot faster way to do that, and I'll show you that now. Um, so with this clip, zoom in, and I'll just make it a little bigger. We have audio clip mixer and audio track mixer. Audio clip mixer is, is here. And it'll, audio clip mixer is, We have our audio clip mixer, and the other window we have is the audio track mix. Now, the two of them, one controls everything in terms of the volume in the track. The, the clip mixer controls just the individual clip. Um, this is track one, and what I want to do is be able to write keyframes on it by using this slider. If I just play this right now, you can see that the volume is coming up pretty high the whole time, and it's going like that. If I want to control the volume while listening to it, which is the whole trick, I have to hit this, um, I hit the re enable track for record, which is the right button. That's fine. I wanna do right. Now that I'm in right mode up here, it's automation mode, meaning if I move this slider, it will be able to create the keyframes. So now if I hit play in the time, oops, no, do not wanna launch now, get away. All right, so if I wanna hit play now in the timeline, I can grab my slider and it's going to 
change the volume in my track. I can hear the volume change. You might not be able to, but I can make it louder, quieter. And then once I hit stop again, you look down at my timeline. It will make the keyframes for you in the timeline, which is the, the whole point of all this stuff. Um, let me do it one more time to show you. So again, this is right by keyframes. We're in the, sorry, we're in the clip mixer now, not the track mixer, the clip mixer. So if I turn this on to enable the automation, I hit play in the timeline. I can make it louder, quieter. Watch as it goes, watch the levels as they get hotter, hotter and quieter. Distorting, but that's okay. So in the clip mixer, once I hit stop, you can look down here now, it's created these keyframes as I was listening to it. So that's the secret in terms of I don't have to create those keyframes by hand. I can just use, to reiterate, the audio clip mixer, make sure it's wide enough so you can see this triangle, which means writing keyframes. You turn that on, play any song or any uh, vocals or music, you will get a keyframe. And if you remember in our presets and our preferences, I turn that setting to 750 milliseconds, meaning it's gonna draw one keyframe almost every second. And that's why I turned it on here. So that those preferences were under um, audio, and you can see it here, linear keyframe thinning, which means it's gonna be fewer keyframes. If you don't have this checked, it'll make a keyframe every like five frames, and there'll be thousands of them. So I chose minimum time interval, 750 milliseconds, which is just under a second. That creates one keyframe every, almost every second as I'm using the clip mixer to control the volume with the right on. I find that a lot faster and a lot easier uh, for writing songs. You can listen to the dialogue. You can ride the volume of the song so you can make it swell when you need to. You can make it back off when you need to. And it's a lot more intimate and humanly controlled when your hand is doing the slider to do that. And you don't have to wait to play it back by making keyframes. So I use that and a lot of editors do that all the time. Um, that's a, the main audio tricks or little you know, important things I wanted to show. There is one more that, again, at the end of my edit, I will always add this to, to everything. So if I go to my super edit, which wasn't open, if I want to add audio dissolves to every edit, um, because oftentimes these edits, if you cross over, it'll be a click or a pop at every edit. You can right click and add a default transition, or you can highlight all the audio clips. And if I zoom in and I hit Shift D, which is default for audio edit, if I zoom in further, you'll see now there's a two frame edit at every edit point. So now by just hitting Shift D, I've added an edit point. They're so small you can't even see them on here, so I'll zoom in and make it taller. But now I have a two frame edit on every edit point, so there's no clicks and no pops, which is not only a sign of like amateur hour, but will make people crazy because you just think you're hearing things all the time. So again, let me undo that. All I did was grabbed all the audio. Um, make sure that you're not choosing the video. Um, and how to do that is linked selection here for every sequence. Right now, I have linked selection is on. So if I touch a video track, the audio track is also highlighted. So if I drag all of it, it's gonna add a dissolve to everything. So I turn off linked selection, so I can just grab all the audio. Then I hit Shift D, which is add default transition. And I now have that little tiny audio dissolve on every single track. This keeps it clean, this keeps the clicks away, and it's a, it's a nice sign of professionalism when you can, you can do that. 